annual celebration. We are looking forward to having our in-person gala in 2022. My name is Daniel Newberry, and it is my honor to serve as the council's executive director and as the MC for this event in this, this seventh year. The council turns 26 years old this month, and we're glad you decided to spend this Thursday afternoon with us. Tonight's program is one and one half hours long. The council is a place-based community, a nonprofit made up of board and staff, thousands of volunteers, and we partner with a dozen agencies and an equal number of community groups. It takes all of us to improve the health of Johnson Creek and our watershed. We are a community. Once again, if you've just joined us, this is Johnson Creek Watershed Council's annual celebration 2021. So we're looking forward to a, a fun-filled evening. Thank you again for joining us. The Johnson Creek Watershed Council sends gratitude to the peoples who have stewarded the land in this watershed we call Johnson Creek for millennia, though this name is not of their choosing and the watershed most likely went by many names. The tribes that most likely lived here include the Cowlitz, Clackamas, Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, Bands of the Chinook, and Cascades, and also the nearby tribes who most likely traveled through the watershed which include Kalapuya, Atfalati, Malala, and Multnomah. Their land was stolen from them and government actions and systems attempted to destroy them. In spite of that, indigenous people still live here today. Portland, Oregon has the ninth largest urban Native American population in the US with over 380 federal recognized tribes represented in the urban Portland metropolitan area. We hope that we honor their legacy and of their living descendants by doing our part to reverse the damage done to the land of the last 175 years through watershed restoration and through education. Before we get started with the program tonight, I'd like to go over a few housekeep housekeeping details related to Zoom. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, if you move your cursor, you'll see the uh, view. If you click on that, you can click on speaker or gallery view. Um, for this event, it's probably gonna look better if you click on the speaker view. So in a few minutes, we'll be conducting a poll. You'll be able to submit your answers in a pop-up box and the results will be displayed on the screen. I'll go into that more in just a second. But first, I would like to mention that the council itself, as an organization, we have a board of 16 people, and I'd like to thank the board for their support and their time during the past year. They're a great group that supports the council in many ways. Their names are Marianne Colgrove, Tim Crawley, Peregrine Edison Lom, David Gruen, Melanie Klim, Jacob Neal, Bruce Newton, Sarah Sapienza, Marianne Schmidt, Dick Schubert, Samantha Sharka and our agency board representatives, Andrew Brown with East Multnomah SWCD, Svetlana Hedin with Portland Bureau of Environmental Services, Katie Holzer with City of Gresham, Roy EY with Multnomah County Road Services, and John Nagy with Clackamas County West. We also have a staff of seven. I'd like to introduce our staff and have them each tell us about their work at the council. So, Let's start with Courtney. Hey folks, I'm Courtney Beckel. Um, I'm the volunteer program manager and I guide our equity programming. I manage our large events like the Watershed Wide and Johnson Creek Cleanup. And I'm the Johnson Creek Watershed lead on the Leech Back Five project. Thank you, Courtney. We'll go next to Catherine. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Charney, and I am the AmeriCorps 
outreach specialist for the 2021 term um, at Johnson Creek Watershed Council. I am able to work with schools um, and school groups and volunteer groups, as well as do outreach on social media and on our website. Great, thank you very much, Catherine. And next is Kathy. Okay, there we go. Hi, I'm Kathy Geiger. Um, I've been with the Watershed Council since 2012. I work part-time as the finance accounting person. I take care of all of our accounting issues. I work real hard to get an A plus on all our external audits. And I also do all our grant tracking. And then I help out with other miscellaneous stuff. And maybe some of you know me from the silent auction. I do do that. So you've got another 20 minutes if you want to go make your bid. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you uh, for reminding everyone about the silent auction, which is about to close. Uh, next is Noah. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Noah Jenkins. I am the Riparian Program Manager for the Johnson Creek Watershed Council. Um, that translates as I do lots of streamside stuff. Uh, so working largely with private landowners throughout the watershed to uh, do revegetation work uh, in streamside areas to uh, get better shade on streams and improve riparian habitat. Um, also do a lot of work on uh, non-native plant control, uh, focusing on things like garlic mustard this time of year, um, and then uh, whatever happens to be in the way of getting native plantings uh, on other properties, the usual suspects, blackberry, weed canary grass, English ivy. Um, so yeah, that's me. I've been at this for more than 15 years now and uh, absolutely love it. Thank you very much, Noah. And next, um, Chuck. Is Chuck here? He's not here. Okay, uh, we'll go to Tiffany then. Great. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Tiffany Mencias. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator, and my role is to do a lot of really fun stuff. Some of it is outreach in the community, like tabling. Now it's a lot of digital stuff, so I manage our social media profiles with um, some other staff members in addition to doing the community a science program. We also have the bilingual nature program that I'm running and lots of other volunteer events. So you should probably see me out and about. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Tiffany and Noah, Kathy, Catherine, Courtney, and um, Chuck. Um, we have a great staff and you'll be hearing more in a little bit about the work they've been doing during the last year. The next uh, group of folks I would like to thank are our business sponsors. Um, this event uh, would not be, made, be possible without business sponsorships. And we have three levels. The highest level is the coho sponsor level. And thank you to PCC Structurals for being a coho sponsor. At the lamprey level, our returning sponsors are Walker Emulsions, Fred Meyer, Biohabitats, City of Portland Bureau of Environmental Services, and OTAC. Thank you to our Lamprey sponsors. Real quick, Daniel, looks like Chuck has joined us. If he wants to introduce oh, himself, he just okay. live. Yeah, just a sec. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, at the Steelhead sponsor level, we have returning sponsors Oregon RFID, Crawley LLP, Geoengineers. Riverview Community Bank, Wolf Water Resources, Clackamas Water Environment Services, and the City of Gresham. Thank you all, business sponsors. We very much appreciate your support of Johnson Creek Watershed Council. In case you just joined us, this is the Johnson Creek Watershed Council's 2021 annual celebration. And it looks like Chuck's with us. Chuck, if you could introduce yourself and tell us what you do at the council. Yes, thank you, Daniel. And first, let me just apologize to everybody for this awkward interruption. It was certainly not intentional having some technical difficulties logging in and it rejected my passcode. But nevertheless, uh, here we are. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for taking 
taking time out of their busy schedules and their busy lives to join us today and celebrate uh, what was an awesome year for the council despite all the challenges and uh, everything else that we've all been dealing with for the last year and a half almost. Um, I am the restoration project manager for the council. Uh, I've been with the council for four years. We've had uh, some great uh, successful restoration projects uh, implemented during that time, including a couple last year that you'll hear more about later today. Uh, my program has two primary focuses. One is in-stream habitat restoration and fish passage, and the other is stormwater. Uh, again, thank you very much, and my apologies for the interruption. Thank you, Chuck. And now it's time to see who else is joining us tonight. <clears throat> I have a short poll here and two questions. Uh, we'll take about 45 seconds. Um, it, this poll asks you um, who you are. So please click on all of the relevant uh, options here that apply. Um, you know, some folks are volunteers and uh, former board and staff, current board and staff, you know, all the different options. So please go ahead and uh, start to answer. We have more than 50 people joining us at the moment. More people, I think we're gonna be uh, coming on a little bit later. I'm seeing that the results are starting to fill in. We've got 18 people responding, 19, 21. So folks are really zooming ahead. Let's see what we've got. Maybe another 15 seconds. Okay, another five seconds. Looks like we've got 40 people. Four, three, two, one. Okay, let's look at the results. The question is how long have you been involved with the Watershed Council over the years? <clears throat> so 62 people tonight have volunteered at restoration or other events, 19% of whom were in the community science program. 16% of the folks work for a community partner organization. 26% for an agency partner. We have 20% former board and staff, 32% current board and staff, 48% current or past donor, 14% your family or friend, one of the above. And what's this? Nobody checked off. I'm with the press and will write a glowing review. Ah, thought I'd try that one. Anyway, let's look at the second uh, question here. How many annual celebrations have you attended? 16% say this is my first, so thank you all uh, for the first timers. We hope to have you back again next year. 9%, this is my second. 38%, three to five people. 15%, six to 10 people. I guess I'd fall in that range as well. More than 10, 22%. We've got some diehards and we are very, very grateful. So, Thank you very much. It's now time for a part of our celebration that we look forward to every year, and that is the keynote address. Tonight's keynote speaker is Duran Coles, PhD. He is a learning strategist with 20 years of experience designing learner-focused competency development training. Duran has a wide-ranging portfolio that runs the gamut from learning solutions for technical topics like a globally utilized online training on river systems analysis to interpersonal skills training, such as his award-winning cultural competency curriculum. Upon completing his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Duran moved to Oregon to complete a master's and doctorate in civil engineering with a water resources focus at Oregon State University. Duran then spent eight years as head mathematics professor for the OSU Educational Opportunities Program leading culturally responsive, responsive efforts to recruit and retain underrepresented science and engineering students. Duran is now owner and principal consultant for DRC Learning Solutions, where he develops, evaluates, and implements curriculum for technical and social justice-oriented educational programs in Portland. Duran is also executive director of the Blueprint Foundation, a Portland nonprofit that implements career-specific mentoring programs for Black youth. The nonprofit focuses on diversifying the green sector through workforce development that improves watershed health while training the next generation of green sector professionals. Duran, thank you very much and welcome. 
Thanks, Daniel. And uh, thanks to the uh, Jonathan Creek staff and board for inviting me to speak today. Uh, if you've ever been in one of my workshops, uh, you know that much like rivers, I uh, uh, naturally meander uh, from, uh, from time to time. So uh, I've decided to sort of uh, line my bank with willows and geotextile fabric. So I will be reading, Daniel. You don't have to quack me today <laughs> to get me to stop. All right, I'll share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, I'd like to talk to you today about intersectional environmentalism and the community centered approach to change. Uh, as most talks do, I'll begin with uh, definitions. Intersectional, environmental, uh, inter, ugh, intersectional environmentalism is a coined term <laughs> termed by Leah Thomas, a black environmentalist who uh, recognized the gap between the predominantly white environmental movement and the predominantly frontline community led in, uh, environmental justice movement. She believes that the two movements must be merged if our planet as we know it is to survive. Further, she believes that to succeed, we need to be intentional and anti-racist in our actions. Leah's definition of intersectional environmentalism is shown here, but it boils down to a movement that is dismantling systemic oppression to reach justice for people and the planet. In other words, there's a recognition that the struggles of people and the planet are interlocked because we are nature. Injustice done to, planet, uh, in, done to the planet impacts us all, disproportionately so, but no one escapes, not even those who benefit from the injustices. The most vivid image in my mind when I think of how planet and people injustice is leading to dire consequences for us all is this image of an education center in the Chesapeake Bay that was shuttered because the land around it is being lost to sea uh, level rise. As an educator, there's something particularly disturbing about seeing evidence of environmental injustice, reducing access to informal learning about the environment in a setting where Black people from my hometown of Baltimore could walk out uh, and experience the beauty of the natural phenomena they just learned about inside the center. It feels like the injustices in our formal education system extending its reach to informal learning and in the process, reinforcing the disconnect from our cultural connection to nature. It's also disturbing because I started my career in the green sector, studying non-point source pollution in Chesapeake Bay. I speak of my origin story often because I feel it's important for us to share our individual journeys to environmentalism, along with our personal and cultural connections to nature that nudged us along that path. Storytelling is important because it brings to light the commonalities in our values regarding the environment and the diversity of our experiences regarding access to nature. I feel this juxtaposition of common values but varied ability to act on those values highlights the interconnectedness between people and planet justice that's at the core of intersectional environmentalism. Moreover, it helps us better understand each other for more successful coalition building. Systemic change takes coalitions. The larger the change, the larger the coalition we need. And for the level of change we need globally, these coalitions must include historically excluded groups. Consequently, at the local level, we must ensure that members of frontline communities have access to opportunities to live out their cultural connections to nature. That's why I love these people. Uh-oh, I'm getting emotional. Hold on one sec. These are Blueprint partners who are establishing a sort of outdoor education center, similar to the center that was shuttered in Maryland. The Leachback 5 project is intended to be a space where budding environmentalists can connect to each other and to nature. 
I'm going to get it together. Just give me a sec. <laughs> it's grassroots and it's systemic change at a local level. And clearly, uh, I, carry very, I care very much about it. We hope the particularly diverse community living in the Johnson Creek watershed can come out, meditate, explore, and learn in a multicultural inclusive setting. It's rewarding and fun work, but it's also intentional because we have to account for the fact that the context in which we are operating is inherently racist. Instilling in us all racist notions and exclusionary practices that could derail our efforts. My colleagues at Capacity Building Partnership often say the system is not broken. It's working as it was intended to work. Coalitions fall apart because of limited resources, opaque decision-making, strict adherence to guidelines for language and practice, and an expansive sense of urgency when deliberate action is needed. So we've committed to a community-centered approach with the Back Five Project that's uh, centered on collectivist action rather than individualistic. Several organizations, public, private, culturally specific, all chipping in their perspective and leaving out the damaging cultural norms of the system. In our coalition, scientists and engineers empower youth to use their own language to describe natural processes and engage in brainstorming. For example, we plan to work with them on an upcoming floodplain reconnection at the site, as well as uh, bridge reconstruction following last year's washout. For their part, government employees help by funding the project and offering their expertise to prepare youth to contribute. I absolutely love highlighting governmental partnerships because I'm acutely aware of the history of community and government uh, interactions that are more adversarial uh, than collaborative. But as it was in history, it does not need to be our future. The LEASH project is very localized, but these institutional acts uh, to call in and center voices of the historically excluded can happen at multiple scales. For example, Blue Prairie Foundation has connecting canopies we're doing this in collaboration with Urban Green Spaces Institute, the Nature Conservancy, and PSU. It's a cross-jurisdiction initiative to redesign Howie Green Spaces, such that the new and diverse, such that new and diverse community stewards are empowered to green and steward their own neighborhoods. Imagine the convening of culturally specific organizations, industry partners like Friends of Trees and Portland Fruit Tree Project educational institutions like PSU and governmental officials across jurisdictions, think Vancouver down to Wilsonville, coming together to review canopy data and coordinate greening programs, such that the investments in green benefit workforce development, job creation, and entrepreneurship for Black, <clears throat> excuse me, Black, Brown, Indigenous, and immigrant community members. And of course, don't forget the added benefit of reconnecting people to their cultural connection to the planet. That's collective impact. That is calling all in and building the coalition we need to tackle those larger global issues like climate change. And we can get this done. It's possible, but it will take discomfort, mistakes, self-reflection to learn from our mistakes and flexibility in our preferred approach to life and work. It will also take something that we learned about as kids, imagination. Blueprint Foundation is creating, uh, I should say co-creating, uh, new engineering design challenges with Turk, Village Child Care, Black parents, and child care providers that take care of Black uh, early learners. And the goal is to help Black parents uh, give them these activities free of charge to teach, help them teach their younger, their young students engineering design skills, while also connecting those same Black families to nature-based learning opportunities. I've been reviewing books uh, that set the stage for these design challenges, so the parent can read the book 
get the, the student uh, really interested in doing the challenge before starting. The theme for these books about becoming engineers and the engineering de uh, design process is consistent. In a nutshell, they posit that despite the problems we face, we can always imagine a solution. Further, we can do it faster as a team. So despite the problems we face, like inequitable uh, education systems, limited access and opportunity, bias-driven microaggressions, and entrenched thinking that degrades relationships within coalitions, despite all the factors that keep the system working as it uh, was intended to work, we can imagine solutions together. Okay. I wanna end here, but I wanna leave you with a couple uh, reflection questions. What local systemic change can you create using a community-centered coalition of your own? And what's stopping you? I tend not to speak for all members of my, my cultural communities, uh, but I feel comfortable saying that uh, the planet and I look forward to learning about your efforts. And thanks for listening. And I'll see you out there. Okay, Daniel, back to you. No quacking was required. Thank you very much, Dr. Coles, for your important keynote speech that really addresses elements of what the Watershed Council aspires to embody. And uh, wanna give you an extra thank you, you and Jason Stroman and your colleagues at the Blueprint Foundation for all your great work on our joint project at Leach Botanical Gardens and throughout the metro area community. You really are an inspiration to all of us. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So now in, um, as part of this, um, presentation, we're going to be looking at what's gone on over the last 12 months in the Watershed Council's work. It's uh, part of the celebration. I look forward to the year in review. And um, I have um, a slideshow here. And let's bring it up. Let's see. Okay, hold on here. Get this up on the screen here. For some reason, here we go. All right. So here we go. The theme of this year's year review slideshow. Hey, Daniel, we're having trouble seeing your slideshow. Can you just reshare that one more time? Okay, let's try that again. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, let's try this once I need again. To stop my share. Uh, okay, let's try it again. Um, let's see, having some technical difficulties here, but. Um, hmm. Okay, this should work now. Yeah, go ahead and just do present mode and you're good to go. Yep, it's good, good, okay. The theme of this year's re year in review shot slideshow is adaptation and resilience. This photo of last September's event, Science in the Park, captures the spirit of what I mean. We were still able to hold this family-oriented environmental education event in Mill Park, albeit masked up and socially distanced. Thank you, Clackamas Water Environment Services, who was the event's primary funder. These two photos taken in Gresham at our 2020 and 2021 Watershed Wide event, which is our largest volunteer event of the year in March, was still held this year. We had foot operated hand washing stations and smaller groups of volunteers. These were adaptations we used to provide COVID safe events. Throughout the pandemic, we were generally restricted to groups of 10 volunteers when working on public land. So we often separated larger groups into groups of 10 or less and worked apart. The numbers of volunteers we had last year were substantially below previous years because of the restrictions, but the work continued. 
When doing trash cleanups in Johnson Creek in August, as many of you know, it's very difficult to socially distance. So we conducted a land-based cleanup, including several stretches of the Springwater Trail. Holding volunteer events has been difficult, but Courtney and Tiffany did a great job of keeping these programs going. Our volunteer program is funded by the Minkeski Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation, Portland General Electric Foundation, Clackamas Water Environment Services, the cities of Gresham and Portland, by the Autzen Foundation, and by our individual donors. With public schools prohibiting field trips, um, working with youth through our service learning program proved challenging. Even so, Catherine, our Confluence AmeriCorps members, still managed to figure out a way how to work in a few field trips with private schools and do some online learning. A great job, Catherine. Our work with schools is funded by the Herbert A. Templeton Foundation and Gray Family Foundation. Thank you. <clears throat> we also hosted several internships with youth, especially internships with a bilingual Spanish language focus. And we were still able to do our work with youth at Leach Botanical Garden in the project Dr. Cole spoke about earlier, working with community groups, the Blueprint Foundation and the African Youth and Community Organization through their youth. This particular photo shows a youth mentor from the African Youth and Community Organization during a pollinator learning activity. With these two groups, Wisdom of the Elders and Friends of Leech Garden were all just completing year two of a five-year restoration, education, workforce development project. As Dr. Coles mentioned, this project is really a, a good example um, an aspiration of the watershed councils to do restoration in a way that includes segments of the watershed's diverse population that have been that have not been included in our restoration work. One way to, we hope to accomplish this goal is to find a nexus that combines the needs of underrepresented groups with restoration. And this community project was begun and developed by all partners. And this is a model that we believe most values the contributions of all the partners. This community project has been funded by multiple sources. Grants have been awarded to the council by the Oregon Community Foundation and the Collins Foundation. And thank you to a major donor who wishes to remain anonymous for supporting our efforts on this project. Since January, we've been working with the management at Stonebridge Apartments near Southeast 92nd and Flavelle. This housing serves low-income senior citizens several of whom have mobility challenges. Many ground floor apartments flood, water on the roads makes it difficult for residents to spot holes on uneven areas of the walkways. In this photo, uh, an AmeriCorps crew <clears throat> planted, planted one of many trees in five gallon containers donated by Portland Parks and Recreation's Urban Forestry Department. The bigger project, which we hope to break ground on in September and October, is a combination of deep paving and raid garden and swale construction, which we hope will lessen flooding and keep water out of a private storm system that drains directly to Johnson Creek. We are partnering with the nonprofit DePave on DePaving parts of this project. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Portland BES engineers, Danny Capsch and SK Amaro, who developed the technical design for this project. We plan to contract with businesses led by underrepresented groups in this project which is something we've been working toward for the past two years. And this is really a team effort. Chuck is managing construction, Noah the planting, and Courtney the planning of volunteers to help with this project. Way to go team JCWC. For many years, we've uh, averaged 20 to 25,000 plantings of native shrubs and trees per year. On this map, you'll see approximately 80 points throughout the watershed of plantings that we've done with crews since our 10-year action plan began in 2015. This is a lot of mostly riparian plantings, and you don't even see the volunteer planting sites represented here, most of which are on Portland Parks and Recreation site, of which there are many. And on that note, thank you to Susan Hawes of Portland Parks for your work for more than 11 years partnering with JCWC on volunteer events. You'll notice several clumpings of sites here, Starting with the lower watershed, you can see my, my cursor here, on land at the interface of City of Milwaukee and um, Clackamas Water Environment Services Territory. 
and they are both funders of our planting program. Thank you. We also have a concentration of sites in the Gresham area, which are funded by East Multnomah SWCD and some by the city of Gresham. So thank you. Our biggest grouping is in the upper watershed in rural Clackamas County. And this has been funded by the Clackamas Stormwater Conservation District and small grants from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Thank you. One of the dots on this map, let's see if I can find, I think it's this one right here, um, is a homeowners association at Clatsop Butte. For the past two years, we've been working with this homeowners association to remove invasive species and plant natives on the property. Uh, yesterday at our staff meeting, Noah told us that a second abutting HOA is interested in having council work on their land as well, which we're excited about because all of this land abuts city of Portland owned tax lots. So the health of a really large um, group of land is being improved together. And thank you to the Bureau of Environmental Services for funding this work. But most of all, Noah, thank you. This is a huge accomplishment here that you've managed in just six planting seasons. It doesn't show everything that you've been involved with for all those earlier years. So we're grateful to our volunteers for their tree planting efforts. Some volunteers, however, want a more scientifically based experience. And for them, we have community science. Volunteers collect important scientific data with specific protocols that help us and our partners in designing restoration projects and managing land. As an example of this, because of bird population data our volunteers collected at Powell Butte with a nonprofit conservation insight, the Portland Water Bureau has delayed construction repair of a reservoir at the Butte by several weeks until the prairie nesting birds that we all counted have fledged from their nests. Other community science projects we conduct include salmon surveys, beaver surveys, dragonfly surveys at three wetlands, and an annual eco blitz. Thank you, Tiffany, for managing this community science program. Fish passage is a key issue the council and our agency partners identified in our 2015 action plan. Since 2016, we have removed, replaced, or retrofitted seven barriers, mostly culverts, and also this dam pictured here. We have three more small fish passage projects we hope to implement this summer. The dam on the left was five and a half feet high and blocked fish passage in Kelly and Mitchell Creeks in unincorporated Multnomah County. We removed this dam last summer. On the right, you'll see a stretch, the same stretch of the creek post project. The substrate here you'll notice um, that you'll see is important and it was placed to recreate a natural stream system because after the water behind the dam was released, we had several feet of mud. And the farmer is actually quite happy to have us spread that mud in his pasture. So kudos to Waterways for the engineering design and to Trask Design and Construction for the implementation. And a big thank you to East Multnomah SWCD, Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, Paul Allen Foundation and American Rivers for the funding. And good job, Chuck, on managing this complex project. Opening habitat to fish is important, but the quality of habitat makes a difference. The first mile of Johnson Creek can resemble a long straight bowling alley at high flow with water rushing through at high speeds and all the potential spawning gravel settling out only when it reaches the Willamette River. Approximately half a mile from the Willamette on Johnson Creek is the Highway 224 Cloverleaf. In Milwaukee, you'll see the the part of it at the very upper part of this photo. And we want to thank the Oregon Department of Transportation for working with us on this project and to Foresight Drone Services for this and other aerial photos. So here's the same project. And in these two photos, I'd like to draw your attention to the gravel bar beneath the yellow arrows. It's the same gravel bar, just the photos are from different angles. The gravel bar formed over this past winter just downstream of one of the rootwad root log jams we installed last summer to create fish habitat. The log structures help to slow down the high stream velocity, provide cover for juvenile salmon, and trap gravel where adult salmon can spawn. 
So this is exactly the type of thing that we hoped would happen and it happened very quickly. One of the structures that you saw in the earlier photograph was located at a super cold tributary entering Johnson Creek through a culvert. In the summer, temperature can reach salmon lethal levels in the Willamette River. So Johnson Creek is a cold water refuge, not only for salmon who spawn on Johnson Creek, but also for those on their way to the Sandy and Mackenzie and upper, other upper Willamette tributaries. This project we hope will serve as habitat for all these fish. A common objective of both this project and the Kelly Creek Dam Removal Project are providing access to habitat in cool areas, part of our cold water restoration strategy to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So thank you to Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board for funding and to Oregon Department of Environmental Quality for helping us to secure mitigation funding to complete this project. And big kudos to Wolf Water Resources for the engineering design and to Biohabitats for the construction. And another great example of project management, Chuck. The pandemic really forced us to rethink many things, including how we communicate with a variety of our constituencies. The picture here is a screenshot from last October's sixth annual science symposium, which like this annual celebration, is usually held at Reed College, but was instead held via Zoom webinar. We relied on Zoom webinars for many of our educational efforts this year. And thank you to Tiffany for creating our new community engagement series of educational webinars on topics ranging from pollinators to working with beaver. These webinars allowed us to reach close to 2000 people, some even from the East Coast because, well, distance is no longer a barrier. We also put more effort into our social media presence during the pandemic, focusing on Facebook and Instagram and on creating more YouTube videos. In particular, our Instagram presence grew substantially, which has allowed us to increase our exposure to a younger demographic. And since George Floyd's tragic death, we have increased our emphasis via social media on intersectional environmentalism. So thank you to Catherine and Tiffany for building and transforming our social media. Our work in transforming our own organization to be inclusive has been funded in the past three years by the Meyer Memorial Trust. And thank you, Meyer Memorial Trust, for investing in the council. One thing that gets lost when we look back just on the last year is that restoration at a site doesn't just happen over the course of a single year. I'd like to close this year in review talk by showing the changes over several years at our largest restoration project in the past few years. This fish passage, wetland restoration and temperature reduction project was constructed in 2019 on Mitchell Creek at property owned by the Centennial School District. Metro, East Multnomah SWCD, OWEB, Department of Environmental Quality and the Nature Conservancy and Portland General Electric funded this project. We had a great engineering design from OTAC and construction work from Biohabitats. And I'd like to give a big thank you to Kathy here because there were a lot of grants on this project. It was complex tracking them all and figuring out the multi matching funds and multi multiple vendors and grant deadlines. And she did it without any issues. And you know, I do want to mention that once again, our auditor told us that Kathy is the most competent nonprofit financial manager she's worked with. And in the six years that I've worked on the audit, we've had a clean audit every time. So thank you, Kathy. In this first picture, we see a shallow pond created by damming up Mitchell Creek with two culverts at the inlet and the outlet. Over decades, fine sediment has left this 0.7 acre pond only 10 inches deep. On a particular hot day in 2016, we measured a change of 14 degrees Celsius across this pond. This photo was taken a month later in July. Uh, excuse me, it was taken the same vantage point in June 2019 during construction. The lower culvert has come out, draining the pond, and note the large wood going in to provide new fish habitat. There's still a remnant of a pond here, very visible. This next photo was taken a month later in July after construction ended. Notice the additional wood structures. The upper culvert is gone. And here, let me just, this is where the upper culvert was. 
and how the vegetation is beginning to grow inward from the margins. This next photo was taken 10 months later in April of 2020. Notice how much the vegetation has grown in a short time. Volunteers during watershed wide events in two years and crews from the wisdom of the elders have planted 10,000 trees, shrubs and willow stakes here over several years. A native seed mix donated by US Fish and Wildlife Service helped to initially repopulate the bare soil here. So we don't think that much sediment really washed downstream. Of scientific interest, Last summer, a group of Confluence AmeriCorps members gathered to do a mortality survey of many plants here. This has allowed us to see which species have done well and which haven't. As climate change intensifies, it's important to know which species will be most appropriate in our watershed at different restoration locations and positions on the landscape. On the right, you'll notice a small offline pond uh, by my cursor here. This was an intentional part of the design to retain habitat for amphibians and dragonflies. And this spring, our board member, Katie Holzer, who is also a watershed scientist with the city of Gresham, organized an egg mass survey and documented several amphibian species, including the sensitive red-legged frog. And here's the final slide for tonight. And this was taken earlier this month. Note how the vegetation has filled in even more. The willows are getting tall and a sizable cattail stand has developed here in the background. Uh, see my cursor. Cattail is great habitat for marsh wrens, birds we never saw here before the project. And we've been doing bird habitats here, uh, surveys for, oh, eight times a year since 2017. And we're also starting to see willows flycatchers. We saw them the first time last summer. After seeing the remnants of standing water in the upper pond back oh, here, approximately here last summer, um, I really stressed that we would not realize the full temperature reduction objectives that we had hoped for this project. But when I looked again early this spring, I saw the cattails and the wapato had been trapping sediment, in effect, building new land so that the ponded area had narrowed and a defined stream channel is slowly forming. In the area further downstream in the pond, approximately here with my uh, cursor, the vegetation is completely closed and the stream channel has changed its shape from a wide and narrow channel to one that is about one and a half feet wide and two and a half feet deep. And this is an ideal channel form with fully formed vegetation which all serve to lower the temperature. So really there, there's no need to worry. When we remove human constraints from a natural system, nature heals, just not necessarily in the way we imagine and not according to our schedule. Nature is marvelous and nature is resilient. Thank you all. And now it's time for us to honor those individuals and organizations who have made exceptional contributions to our work in the past year. So I'll pass the baton to Courtney Beckel, our volunteer program manager for the next part of this event. Thanks, Danielle, that was really great. Got some really good stuff in there, love that. Um, so I'm Courtney. Good to be here tonight. I uh, wish I could see your faces, but uh, I know you're there. I saw you logged in. I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're out there. Um, I'm honored to be presenting the Ruffle Awards tonight, as Daniel said. So um, these awards go to individuals and groups whose actions in the watershed in the past year best exemplify our mission to promote restoration with the help of the community. So, why do we call them Riffle Awards? Um, riffles, for those of you who don't know, are kind of like a mini rapid. And they're those little bubbly ripples in a stream where water rushes over the rocks. It churns oxygen into the stream. Um, and as many of you know, getting that dissolved oxygen into the water is critical for fish, 
aquatic insects and other critters. So riffles are a foundational part of stream health, just like our riffle award winners are a foundational part of our success in restoring the creek. That's why we call it that. So the riffle awards are presented in three categories this year. We have agency partner, community partner, and the Ernie Francisco Award for an individual who has left an indelible legacy on the council for the year. So the first award of the night is agency partner. Um, agency partnerships help us make the landscape scale impact in the watershed that makes our work so important. And we work with lots of agency partners, all with a common vision to help improve hydrologic function, water quality, habitat value, and community involvement in the watershed. So the first award of the night, the winner of the Agency Riffle Award is the City of Milwaukee. In the past year, Milwaukee City Planning and Natural Resource staff has assisted us in permitting and planning both the Lower Johnson Creek Habitat Enhancement Project and a future similar project. They also assisted us in obtaining stormwater infrastructure GIS data for a pipe shed analysis that a PSU student performed for us. And finally, they, they partnered with us on a long-term funding agreement for our riparian planting program with the city. So we have a little video here to accept the award on behalf of the city of Milwaukee is the city's mayor, Mark Gambo. Um, and I want to make sure, are you all seeing my screen? Are we ready to? Yeah, go for it. Thanks. I'm the mayor of Milwaukee, and I'm super excited to be accepting this award on behalf of the city of Milwaukee. Um, Johnson Report Street Council has been such a critical partner to us. We made our vision, we created our vision several years ago, called the city to be entirely Hey, Courtney, we lost the sound on there. Maybe pause it and let's back it up a little bit. Yes, I'll, we'll, we'll try this one more time and I'll mute myself as well. I think that might have been the issue. Let's just start it from the beginning, shall we? Excuse me, muting yourself maybe is the problem. So just keep it up. Let's see. Partner to us. We made our vision, we created our vision several years ago, called the city to be highly equitable, likely livable, completely sustainable. And that's a tall order. And to do that, uh, you need really powerful partners like the Council of Watershed Council. We specifically called out watersheds in both the vision and our new comp plan that we're still working on for all this division. Um, because they are such an important part of the ecosystem and the life of the people. And so having powerful partners that we can help uh, by funding a little extra or by uh, helping on GIS issues or with, with uh, permitting to make it easier for them to do their work, um, that partnership will be the kind of thing that gets us to a world where humans are living in harmony with nature and not having to correct 100 year errors our watersheds. Um, in any case, thank you so much for the support. Uh, look forward to working with Allison for years. Hey, uh, Courtney, this is Daniel. I'm going to take a chance here. Mark Gamba is actually listening to the celebration right now. We hope that by doing these videos, it would save time, but I'm wondering if we could maybe have Mark say something now since he's actually here and we could we could hear him much better. So um, I'm thinking what we could do is just, um, 
promote Mark Gamma. Mark, um, you okay with um, giving your acceptance? <laughs> and sure. we're really sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. It's, uh, it's the world we're in right now, right? Nothing but technical difficulties. Um, yeah, it was it, it was a great surprise to learn that we won this award, uh, but it it goes in line with with all of the work that we're trying to do citywide. I, I was I said, and I I couldn't hear it, so I'm assuming the rest of you couldn't hear it. That um, you know we set our vision a few years back to uh, be a city that's entirely equitable, delightfully livable, and completely sustainable. And a big part of being a completely sustainable community is having a, a healthy watershed and healthy tree canopy and things like that. Uh, we couldn't do any of those things without partners like Johnson Creek Watershed Council. So uh, whenever they need help from us, whether it's with the GIS or with funding, uh, we are going to be there for them because uh, they're doing the work that's going to get both our city and the region uh, and ultimately this world back to a place where we have a functioning uh, environment that um, get, takes care of us because we can't live without a, without a healthy natural environment. So thank you for the work that you do uh, and count on Milwaukee to work with you from now on. Thanks, Mark, appreciate that. <laughs> Um, so let's try this again. I hope this next one works okay. Um, our second award of the night is community partner. Let's see. Oh, I gave it away. Um, our organization is at its core an intricate web of partnerships. Like a single tree in the forest, we are without context and we have little meaning without all the other trees and the full ecology of the groups around us. So that is to say that we can't make the powerful impact on the watershed without our community partners. This year we worked with more than 40 truly dedicated community and nonprofit groups. And the winner of the Community Partner Ruffle Award is the Blueprint Foundation. Um, so the Blueprint Foundation has been our strongest partner, hands down, in this difficult year from all the work we've done together on the Leach Back Five project to their participation in community science projects, the cleanup and watershed wide. They've been there for it all. So thank you so much for your support this year. And here to accept the award on behalf of the Blueprint Foundation is Program Director Jason Stroman. So I'm gonna pull up that video here. Hi, this is Jason Stroman here, Program Director for the Blueprint Foundation. On behalf of everyone at the organization, we just want to say thank you for this great recognition by Johnson Creek Watershed Council. The council has been an amazing partner with us over the years to help us further our mission of creating more equitable access to nature-based learning and career exploration in the green sector. So again, we just want to say thank you and we look forward to a continued partnership and doing great things for our community. Thank you. And thanks again, um, Jason and everyone at Blueprint. Got one chat. What does this chat say? That work okay, guys? Yep, it was great. Audio came great. Perfect, thanks. Um, wonderful, so our final award of the night is our Ernie Francisco Award. And Ernie was one of the council's founders who sadly is no longer with us. Many, uh, many of you here tonight knew Ernie well and she's greatly missed. The Ernie Francisco Award is our highest individual volunteer honor. It goes to a single outstanding person whose contributions have left a lasting impression on our work. And the winner of the community partner, I'm sorry, excuse me, the winner of our Ernie Francisco Ruffle Award is Gary Klein. So Gary, we know that you've received this award in the past, but it was almost 15 years ago, and you're so nice. 
You earned it twice. That's what I say. <laughs> um, your support means so much to us from your consistent and generous checking in to ask what supplies we need to your MacGyver skills and fashioning and customizing the special supplies like hand washing stations and custom wooden event signs that we need for all of our events. You've been a key volunteer with us for over two decades. So we just wanna say thank you, Gary. Let's go ahead and hear a few words from Gary. Hi, I'm Gary Klein. Thank you very much for the Riffle Award, that's also known as the Erding Francisco Award, who's one of the co-founders of Johnson Creek Watershed Council. I really enjoyed doing different things for Johnson Creek Watershed Council, like getting tools, making things that they use in the creek, and fixing things. I've been by the creek for over 70 years and watched it evolve. Now that Johnson Creek Watershed Council is here working on the creek, for over 26 years, it's for the better. I've been assisting for over 20 years now. Thank you very much. All right, well, thanks again, Gary. Uh, let's have like a little virtual applause, right? You could just almost hear it now. Yes, wonderful. <laughs> that wraps up our Riffle Award ceremony. I just wanna say thank you one more time to all of our amazing partners and our volunteers. Um, and I want to invite Tim Crawley, our board chair, um, who has a few words to share with us tonight. Good evening. Thank you all for attending our 2021 annual celebration. It has been really amazing to hear from the members of our organization and community tonight. Kaz, our eye of the creek, Tiffany, our creek educator, and the one keeping us moving through our program this evening. Dr. Coles, our advisor and counselor, Courtney, our inspirer and connector to the Creek, and Daniel, our leader at the helm, and partners, Mark, Jason, and Gary. We've done such amazing work over this past year, despite the very real challenges we have faced. And over this past year, we've learned how much more we have needed our Creek as a sanctuary, as a refuge, breath of fresh air, and a reminder that we can once again become a beautiful and integral part of our ecosystem as protectors and sustainers of the living, breathing organism of our creek. The prefix of ecosystem is eco, derived from the Greek oiko or oikos, meaning house or household. We are a part of this household we call Johnson Creek. And as a part of this household, as its stewards and hosts, we call on each of you to help us continue to keep our home in order, to keep our creek free from debris, to keep its wildlife shaded and cool in the days ahead, to ensure its flow, to keep it a place of openness and hospitality, a place where all of its creatures, big and small, are welcome under its roof. We ask each of you to consider once again making a contribution now to help us maintain that which we call our home. We depend upon you and, and your generosity. We depend upon you and our generosity for all of the things that we do, including our education programs, cleanups, habitat restoration, and community partnerships. So please take these next few moments to donate to the council, to the creek, and to the watershed now by going to jcwc.org slash donate or by texting the word donate to 503-386-9883. Now the chat will have this information listed for you. If you donate today, board member Dick Schubert and his wife Sue will match donations up to $2,500. Again, that's jcwc.org slash donate, or text the word donate to 503-386-9883.
Thank you so much. And back to Daniel Newberry. Thank you, Tim, for that inspiring talk. And while everybody is thinking about donating and texting and going online, <clears throat> um, I want to mention that this is also the time we're, we're just finishing up here, but we have one more thing we want to tell everybody about, and that is the silent auction winners. So for the past two years, when we've done our virtual celebration, we've had our uh, silent auction online. And uh, let's see, we have our, our um, silent auction winners here. And let's see if I can, uh, I can get them up on the screen. Let's see, auction winners. And here we go. So I'll go ahead and read it. The names of the silent auction winners, Ron Warenga, Amy Bauer, Stephen Batchuber, Jess Tyler, Alvi Siuma, Marianne Colgrove, Sharon Klein, Timothy Novak, Evan Osterlin, Daniel Newberry, Richard Schubert, Jess Tyler, Mas Matt Clark, hello Matt, former executive director, Timothy Novak, Richard Dickinson, Svetlana Hedin, and Melanie Klim. And we are really grateful to everybody because this means that every single one of our silent auction packages <clears throat> sold this year. So thank you all for coming once again um, to the Johnson Creek Watershed Council's annual celebration virtual edition 2021. We hope you have a wonderful evening and we hope to see you at an event later this year and at an in-person event once again at Reed College next May. So thank you all very much. <clears throat>